this morning for communion, uh, we're going to focus on the amazing privilege of being saved by God's grace. We'll do this by reading from Isaiah chapter 53. If you do not have a Bible, there are some men up front who are willing to put one in your hand, so as they come down the aisle, please raise your hand and they will give one to you. And if you don't have a Bible, please take this one with you as a gift from Grace Bible Church. So let's pray. Father, as we have just sung that your son was obedient to the point of death on the cross, that he would go there to honor his father, to die for sinners like you and me, to die so that we could have renewed life. And it was through his death that we are reconciled to you. So we praise you, Lord. We thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So please turn with me to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53. And we're going to read verses 1 through 6. So read along with me, please. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and, did not, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging, we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But Yahweh has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Isaiah is a book of prophecy. It derives its title from its author, whose name means the Lord is salvation. It is written... It was written approximately 700 years prior to Jesus' coming. And Isaiah provides information on the day of the Lord and the time that follows. The centerpiece of Isaiah's book is chapter 53, which portrays Jesus as the slain Lamb of God. The details in this chapter descri describe Christ's substitutionary death, his, resur his resurrection, his saving of sinners, and his exaltation. Isaiah 53, in summary, not only describes what is necessary for a sinner to believe and to be forgiven of sin, but also goes beyond the prophecy of Calvary. It sets the context of the end of human history beyond today to the time in the future when Israel as a nation will turn to Jesus Christ. John MacArthur says this, what we are hearing in this chapter is a confession of the Jews at the end of human history as they look back on the cross and realize how wrong they were about Jesus Christ and how they misjudged the most monumental Let's look again at the first three verses in Isaiah 53. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. These verses describe the way the Jews viewed Jesus. They would say that Jesus' origin was like 
a root in parched ground. Their perception was that it was nothing notable or important or necessary. Nothing majestic about him. No stately form. His appearance had nothing to attract them. In other words, there was nothing about him that said Messiah. He was despised and forsaken of men, and they did not esteem him. His beginning can be described as he came out of nowhere to an insignificant place and born to a family of no notoriety. Jesus appeared to be a common man born to a common family, surrounded by common people in a common town. He had not been exposed to religious training, nor had he been exposed to elite people in leadership. But a change in the, views, in the Jews' perception of Christ begins in verse 4. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. The transition comes from the very first word, surely. This is an exclamation. It is a sudden recognition by the Jews that they were wrong. This is a dramatic change from their previous perception that Jesus was a blasphemer and that he died by the hand of God to pay for his horrendous, terrible sins. It is like they are saying, now we see our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. It is a complete change of mind. As a nation, they will one day recognize, recognize that Jesus became their substitute, died in their place, and gave his life so that their life could be redeemed. They will one day recognize that he was pierced through for their transgressions and crushed for their iniquities. As a nation, they're going to see and understand for the first time that they were wrong about Jesus. Prior to their, con their conversion, they esteemed Jesus as stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. The same goes for us who have been redeemed. Only when our eyes are opened to the amazing gift of grace do we grasp the truth about who Jesus is. Only at the time of our salvation are we able to comprehend the truth about his miraculous rescue mission to save sinners, to save us. Those of you who are in Quipping Hour this morning heard Omri made re make reference to 1 Corinthians 2.14. It says, as a natural man, we could not accept the things of God because we, it was, they were foolishness to us. And we could not understand the things of God because we were spiritually appraised. Verse 6 says, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each has turned to his own way. One author puts it this way. Sheep do what sheep do. That's the analogy. They wander off into danger. That was us. Our nature was wrong. We went our own way. So if you're here today, and through your own admission, you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it is our utmost prayer that you would just as this future generation of Jews will do, change your mind about Christ and how you think about his death and resurrection. We pray that you would understand, just as it says in Isaiah 59, 2, that your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you all from you so that he does not hear. Cry out to him for forgiveness. You'll never regret it. But if you choose not to do that, please be prepared to face all eternity in regret. 
Embrace the truth that only the only way to be reconciled to God is through Jesus. And let today be the day of your salvation. If this is not your desire, please allow the bread and juice to pass by. But please talk to one of the elders before you leave today. We'd be very happy to sit with you and discuss what it means to know Jesus Christ. Men, please come in service. Believers, as you prepare your hearts, meditate on the grace that has been the grace of God and confess your sins. When your heart is ready, you may take communion on your own. And I'll be back in a few minutes to close our time in prayer.